Today, I just wanted to talk briefly about pioneers and about being pioneers. And so, as I guess I should start at the beginning of the sh show, right? Uh-huh, exit show. I don't know why it did that. I've been having technology challenges this morning. As my colleague Veronique understood when, I, when she came to pick me up at the airport, um, I had to rebuild this presentation from scratch this morning. It crashed on me last night, and it wasn't, making, it wasn't doing a good thing. So it's a new presentation. It's a new day. It's a new presentation. <clears throat> uh, thankfully, the team here was very tolerant of me not sending you the slides ahead of time. Um, so thank you. So when talking, thinking about pioneering, and I, you know, the first thought that occurred to me is, you know, the word pioneering is often referred to people and, and pioneering activities. Uh, but pioneering is also used to refer to uh, species, pioneering species that kind of regenerate a landscape after a fire or after a flood. Um, and pioneering is also used to refer to the idea of um, going and venturing forth, going somewhere where others haven't been. This image I found um, from a, an old slide uh, from the Dempster Highway in the High Arctic. And so it sort of is, in a sense, the beginning of my journey to discovering cold climate sustainable design uh, and working in extreme places. Uh, I spent uh, a, first, a first summer actually up in Inuvik in the mid 80s and it really was kind of a formative moment in terms of starting a conversation about what does sustainable design mean. But I'm gonna take you a little bit back in time first of all because I think to, to think about the future we have to kind of reflect on where we've been and think about the ideas that we're talking about today and what we think is sort of current and trendy and hot button issues. And so I'm gonna, since it's you know, um, 2017 and since it's you know, Canada's 150th, I'm just gonna go back in decades, sort of starting back 100 years ago and kind of move us forward and jump in, in 50 and then 10 year increments. So back 100 years ago, um, the idea of health and wellness in the workplace was already becoming a current idea. Uh, this particular image is actually from the American Review of Reviews, a very conservative publication um, that uh, had this advertisement uh, that said, daylight and fresh air pay. And this was uh, an ad for a, a manufacturer that was selling factory buildings in, uh, in that period in 1917-1918 time. So they're talking about that you know, healthy workplaces add value for, um, for well-being, but also for good corporate, uh, good business sense. So none of these ideas are new, and that's, I think, one of my key messages today is that the economy is circular, the future is circular, all of these old ideas become new again. And uh, so if you think this is a hot new trend, sure it is, and it's a really old idea, and that's how you know it's a good idea, because it keeps coming back around. So. Uh, I grew up in, in Montreal, and uh, 1967 was a very big year in my youth. Um, but it's also, you know, doing that sort of going back to Canada's 100th birthday. Um, so what was the conversation about in, around green buildings or sustainability? The theme of, of Expo 67 was man and his world. You might recall this. Anybody, anybody old enough to remember this? A few people. Thank you. Uh, now I don't feel so bad. Um, Man and his world, right? So it was about how we live on this planet, the beginnings of that conversation about our interaction with our planet and our environment. Uh, but of course it was men, there was no women involved in the story, they, they were not in the picture. This of course was the Canadian pavilion uh, designed by Arthur Erickson. And uh, there's lots of you know, narrative around what the symbols of Canada were at that time, but also the symbols of how we live on this planet, Canada or not. So that was the 60s. There was lots going on in the 60s. But the conversation around energy and environment was really kind of a hippy-dippy kind of conversation. There were tree huggers. There were hippies. There were people who were kind of doing the back to the land thing. But the mainstream world was not paying attention to energy and environment because energy was abundant, right? So we keep going through these stages of abundance and scarcity. So then what happened? Well, in 73, actually, we had an energy crisis. But I'm doing this in years of 10, so I'm doing this in jumps of 10 years. So in 73, there was the first energy crisis. Anybody remember the first energy crisis? 
lineups at the gas stations. Um, so, in fact, there was a marvelous exhibition at the Canadian Centre for Architecture a few years ago called Surrey Out of Gas. If you have a chance to see it or get the catalogue for it, it's really lovely. This image here on the right comes from that exhibition, in fact. Um, but the architectural response to that first energy crisis was really stunning. So the world of architecture, the world of building design, the world of interior design, the world of engineering shifted, on, pivoted on that idea that energy was now scarce. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Um, buildings got sick. There was a reason why buildings got sick. What happened? We buttoned our buildings up nice and tight so that no energy could possibly escape. Um, the early, um, the thing called the Saskatchewan Conservation House, which then became the Passive House Standard, was from that period. Everything was more insulation, more air tightness, less ventilation. The ASHRAE standards dropped in half. ASHRAE is the American Society for Heating and Refrigeration Engineering. That's the benchmark standard for how much ventilation you need for health and well-being. They just cut everything in half. They just said, well, we thought you needed this much air. Actually, we can do with half. No problem. Um, windows that open, no, don't bother with those. You should just seal up the building nice and tight. Um, so air tightness became the order of the day. Um, and then things started to fail, right? That paradigm shifted very quickly after that first energy crisis, and the failure happened very quickly thereafter. So by the 70s, by the late 70s, um, the whole conversation around sick building syndrome was already very much a topic of conversation. It was very current. There are people who are still practicing in Canada today who were the pioneers of this uh, attitude around sick buildings and what to do about them. Completely related, but completely not related, there were other parallel universes happening in Canada. Um, by the mid-80s, we were working with First Nations communities across Alberta, across northern Alberta mostly, a little bit down south uh, in Treaty 7 territory and in Blackfoot territory, but mostly we, at that time in the 80s, we were working with First Nations communities. And we discovered, obviously, a very different attitude, a different attitude towards community, a different attitude towards environment, a different attitude towards living in relationship with people and with nature. And so it was really fascinating because it occurred to me me occurred to us as, as an architectural team that there had to be a better way. There had to be a way of engaging people in a process of talking about design and about thinking about sustainability in a whole different way, not making sick buildings. Um, we started to design, um, by, the, by the mid 80s, we started to design uh, buildings that were healthy for people and the community and the planet. We started to pay attention to how we could do that. How do we get buildings that really work for everybody, that integrate culture, that integrate values and vision, uh, that integrate environment and, and uh, resources that are about abundance and about scarcity at the same time, right? Because um, both are true, right? There's always abundance. There's plenty of everything. And there's also a real imperative to be frugal. And both are true. Um, you know, in, in the 90s, we started to get really good at doing energy modeling and figuring out that sometimes you can rotate a building by seven degrees and save 5% of its energy. Who knew, right? So when people say, how do you drive energy use down without increasing costs? That was the journey, figure that out. And, you know, by doing simple things like rotating a building, it's amazing how it doesn't cost anything different when you rotate it. Um, it's uh, also amazing how it doesn't cost anything different when you engage people in the process of planning and design. But when you do that, when you actually invite people into the conversation of how to create buildings, you start to co-create environments that are inspiring, that are generative, that are regenerative, and that are not just sustainable from an environmental metrics perspective, but sustainable from a community engagement perspective, which ultimately is more important. By the 90s, we started to build rating systems. Why did we do that? Well, you know, does any, anybody ever heard of a, a thing called Esperanto? 
Yeah, a few people have heard of that thing called Esperanto. There's always been a quest to create a universal language, right? Humans have kind of, since the biblical times, uh, have tried to find a way to create a universal language. Esperanto was that. Uh, English has actually become the universal language, right? Nobody kind of paid attention to Esperanto. Well, guess what? Lead became the universal language. So we, as a green buildings community, as an architectural community, as a design community, as a construction community, set out to create a rating system because rating systems aren't really about rating systems. Rating systems are about having a common language amongst many, many different players. When you think about all the different people who are involved in the planning, the design, the construction, and the operation, and the life cycle of buildings, there's lots of people with lots of different backgrounds. Not everybody's trained as an architect, or trained as an interior designer, or trained as an engineer, but to create a common language so that everybody can be on the same page about what creates healthy buildings. So LEED is actually a much more recent idea. You know, somebody asked me earlier about Passive House, and I'll touch on that, but LEED is actually a much more contemporary idea. Passive House is a much older idea, and it's much more narrowly focused. Uh, LEED is a, a holistic idea about the environment, about energy, about water, about toxicity, about indoor air quality, about all of those wraparound things. So that was why we created LEED. I was part of that process and part of that journey across Canada and across, well, I guess really my focus was really in Canada, but in bringing that in that rating system to Canada. Um, around that time, we started to pay really close attention to how we achieve sustainable results. And we achieve sustainable results by being really integrative, right? Everything is connected. So if you put more insulation, you need a smaller mechanical system. If you put a smaller mechanical system, it costs less to operate. If you can open the windows, then you get fresh air for free. If you have daylight and lots of daylight, then the light is for free. So lots of resources are out there in abundance if you pay attention to them. So this was really the beginning early days of, of integrated design. What we learned is that to get design to work well in an integrated way, you need lots of people to put their best selves into the room, to bring their best ideas into the room so that we can synthesize and integrate. And that's, that's its own art form. By 2007, the conversation started to shift. So I'm taking you in 10-year jumps very quickly because we only have 20 minutes. Uh, so you get, you get the journey of the last 100 years in 20 minutes. Um, so we're up to 2007. The conversation started to shift to the topic of climate change. Climate change wasn't a new topic either, right? It had been around for a long time. But um, you know, Thomas Friedman's book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, was really kind of a, a compelling bestseller that started to capture the public imagination and to popularize a lot of what we had been talking about in the green building world. By this time, the green building conference, US green building conference called Green Build, had gone from 5,000 people attending back in 97 to 50,000 people attending in 2007. So that's how quickly this conversation expanded. We started to focus on buildings being energy generating. Um, this image here is from the Greenstone Government of Canada building that we designed up in Yellowknife back in 2000. It opened in 2005, and it had the first building integrated photovoltaics. Uh, so everybody's talking PV these days, not a new idea either. None of these things are new ideas, just saying. <laughs> um, they've been around for a while. Um, but um, really important that we keep those ideas alive and that we keep passing that torch. Um, so building integrated photovoltaics, double duty as sunshades, generates electricity, worked better than anticipated. Guess why? Everyone originally said, oh, you can't do that in Yellowknife. It's really dark there. It's like, well, actually, no, it's just as many hours of daylight as anywhere else. They're just more concentrated. Um, and guess what? Um, the PV likes being cold. Funny that. It performed better than expected. We got RAIC Innovation Awards for it because it just was behaving better than anticipated. Windows that open. Why do we design buildings with windows that open? This image on the left is actually the water center here in Calgary. Um, buildings with windows that open. So just a little anecdote actually about the water center. Um, about a year after that building opened, some of you may know that building, right? It's just down 
across from the Stampede Grounds, right? Um, it's a building that we designed in conjunction with Sturgis's office back in around that 2002, three, four, five, someplace in there. Um, and about a year after it opened, um, there was a, a electrical fire in the air handling unit, uh, was one of the electrostatic filters that had a failure in it. And as a result of that, the entire air handling unit, one out of three air handling units, went down entirely. And it took about nine months for them to get a replacement because this was a big custom built thing. And um, in the meantime, that building was still perfectly functional because we had windows that opened. And the insurance guy said, yeah, you know what, if you guys hadn't have had windows that opened, we would have probably had to relocate all those people at great expense to the city of Calgary um, because the building would have been uninhabitable under just normal circumstances. But because we had windows that opened, guess what? Not only do you create healthier environments, you also mitigate risk. So that's kind of neat. Using the sun, as I said, uh, not a new idea either. <coughs> Right? Uh, passive strategies, active strategies, PV strategies. Uh, the building on the right is the Eastgate uh, Government of Canada building, Environment Canada building in Edmonton. Um, has a LEED Gold certification as well. The one on the left is that same Greenstone Government of Canada building from Yellowknife. Again, also LEED Gold certification. Those are all buildings that have uh, a big amount of photovoltaics integrated into them. And we're seeing more and more of that. The costs are finally coming down. Um, there's a lot of other sort of passive and active strategies that we've discovered more and more critical. So these things, we call them low energy vertical circulation systems. Right? <laughs> um, so that works because people get healthy. They stay fit. Um, when the technology doesn't cooperate, this works. Uh, obviously, we have elevators in these buildings for people who need assistance with trans vertical mobility. But uh, for the rest of the 90% of us, you know, we should really practice using the stairs. And uh, if we do that all the time, then uh, we stay fit and the building stays fit and our energy budget goes way down. So win, win, win all the way around. The more active we can be, the better. Again, the water center celebrating water. Right, so water is an important resource. Uh, we don't talk about it enough. Many of the green building rating systems don't pay enough attention. LEED does a pretty good job of paying attention to water, could be better. But water is really a precious resource that's critical to life. And uh, we need to be really smart about how we use water. Um, and whatever we're doing in the world of sustainable design, we have to always be thinking about that whole cycle of water. Where, where does the water come from? Where does the water go? How do we both show it in the landscape, as we did here, uh, but also how do we be frugal with the use of it so that we're not wasting water, uh, especially potable water? Lots of conversations around passive house and around how you can reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. This is a cute little exhibition that we saw in Munich last spring. I liked it because it sort of said plus box minus box. <laughs> sort of like, how do you become regenerative? That's kind of fun. Um, so jumping ahead to 2007, I wanted to show you a little bit about our, our emergency operations center here in Calgary. Another really cool LEED Gold building. Um, and um, this was the original design concept of it, the plasticine model. Uh, and uh, this building lives lightly in its neighborhood. It um, is very tucked in because this was a building that the community didn't want. So this is also part of sustainable design. Part of sustainable design is engaging community to design buildings that actually they fall in love with, even though it may be something that they didn't want. It is, it is, totally. Um, and uh, it was, it's designed with a healthy workplace environment because this is a building that most of the time has only got about 20, 30 people working there, except for in an emergency like Calgary's floods. And then all of a sudden, um, 200 to 300 people end up in that building 24 seven. And uh, if it's not a comfortable environment, uh, it doesn't work well. So this is a largely underground building and um, with these lovely courtyards that bring daylight in, 
that make this a really healthy, comfortable workplace, a delightful place to be, and uh, a place where people can get their job done, even when we do have the mayor, the premier, and the prime minister in the building at the same minute dealing with floods. Just a couple more thoughts very quickly on other discoveries that we've learned. You know, daylight, when we, had, when we found the former Dell building in Edmonton and the service credit union decided to buy it, we sort of went, oh, that's an interesting corporate headquarters. Where's your daylight? So we shifted it. And uh, that's what it looks like now. And uh, it's a building that really is delightful, vibrant, and a place that a, a major corporate body in, Cal in Alberta is proud to call its home. Um, we designed for winter. Uh, this building is actually called the Mosaic Center. Um, it has the photovoltaic cladding, which is sort of a, an emerging trend, as you can see in buildings. Uh, it's also a, an absolutely delightful building if you happen to find yourself up in South Edmonton. It's not far from the airport, so if you're in the neighborhood, you should drop by. There's a great restaurant there. Um, existing buildings are a very big part of the future. So now I'm going to, so I've brought us up to almost the present. So we've gone from sort of 1917 through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and we're pretty much up to the present. And the, the current preoccupation in the world of sustainable buildings is more than anything around existing buildings. Because ultimately, we can't design our way out of climate change. We can't build enough new buildings to reduce our carbon footprint. We have to address the question of the existing building stock. And so we started a conversation called Reimagine about six or seven years ago. And today, we're reimagining a number of existing buildings all across Alberta and hopefully all across Canada. Uh, we're, take, we're transforming nasty, ugly, old, leaky buildings that don't perform into beautiful, healthy, sustainable buildings that do perform. And we know that people love data. So um, data is not a thing in and of itself. It's just a thing that people find emotionally appealing. And so we provide data. Uh, for those who like it. Um, but um, in actual fact, what really matters is that the quality of the environment is so much better than before. And uh, the metrics are just there to help reassure those who weren't convinced by their own experiential love of the, the success of the space. Um, so we do have great data for all of these buildings. So we've driven energy costs down to 50%. We've generated 50% more on-site electricity. Um, all of those things are good, but the most important thing is that we're really creating better buildings for people and for the planet. So a number of things we've learned over the years. We've learned that north is different than south. So first clue, if you look at a building and you see that north is the same as south, chances are it's not designed sustainably because it's just the sun's not in both places at once. I've got beautiful photographs from Australia around where you put your shading if you happen to be on that side of the planet. Um, you know, using the sun, of course, sh um, shading on the south in Canada, opening windows, as I've said, um, taking advantage of what's free and abundant, like daylight and sunshine, uh, creating buildings that are active so that people can be encouraged to stay healthy and be healthy. Uh, so much of what's happening in the world of sustainability is around health and well-being. Um, celebrating water, reimagining existing buildings, because we have too many of them that are in terrible condition. And I want to talk a little bit to sort of go fast forward to the fact that the future is circular. So just a couple more things about the future. So say right now we're seeing the emergence of new standards like WELL, which is kind of the next gen of LEED. We're all focused on human well-being, more, more on the human side, um, more on the health side. Um, again, people love standards. People love that common language. There's value in building common language. And there's also just value in just having good common sense. Um, say the future is circular. This is actually an image from a building that we've got on the boards, as it were, in Edmonton. Um, but I think it's really important that we think about <coughs> the future as being 
integrating a lot of these ideas, integrating what's abundant, what's free, integrating community, integrating culture, integrating values and vision, and focusing on buildings and communities that make us well, that make us healthy, that make us delighted, uh, that make us happy. That, those are the real metrics, right? The, the data is interesting, but the real metrics are, is, is the space that we're in full of delight, full of energy? Does it, do we create uh, buildings and communities that enable us to work better together? There's lots of conversation, and certainly in, by 2027, so I'm fast forwarding us that next 10 years, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this conversation about the circular economy. So you'll be hearing more about this, you know, waste equals food. I mean, again, this is conversations that have been going on for decades. Um, my colleague Bill McDonough, one of the pioneering architects in the green building space, uh, started a whole organization called Cradle to Cradle to focus on, you know, the whole flow of energy, materials, and, um, and resources. We're going to be seeing a lot more connection between economy, energy, human well-being, and, and the built environment. So all of those things are connected. And we're going to be seeing a lot more conversations about living cities, about food, about food sources, about food security. Um, and we're going to be thinking a lot more about extreme climates. This uh, picture I took up in Athabasca uh, day before yesterday. So I flew from Toronto where the weather was plus 20 and everything was still green. There wasn't even leaves turning color to Edmonton, where it looked very similar to here. Drove up the road to Athabasca, where it looked like that. Um, and um, this is a building that we designed for Athabasca University called the Academic Research Center. Uh, and uh, so I took advantage of that to take some winter pictures. So uh, we live in winter cities. All of us do. Uh, we live in a place where the climate is continually changing. And uh, sustainable buildings are are uh, a very much a part of our future of our circular economy.